Well, hey, One Life, my name is Trey McLean. I'm one of the teaching pastors for the One Life Network. I'm so excited. It's Christmas time. Our family has been watching Christmas movies. We are, we are thrilled for the Christmas season. Earlier today on your sites, your campus pastors asked you a question about what your favorite Christmas movie is. And we had five up there. And actually, earlier this week, I asked our staff that exact same question. And our staff was evenly divided. Half the staff are National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation people. The other half are Elf. I personally fall in the elf crowd just because there's not as many awkward scenes with my kids. But, but one of those movies is a movie that I have a lot of memories of as a kid. And it's the movie It's a Wonderful Life. Now, when I sent that survey out to our staff, some of our younger staff members were like, I don't know that movie. Is that the one in black and white? Like, they, they had no recollection about the movie at all. And so they voted it last, and they just aren't cultured. Um, but if you're a student, I want to encourage you. Uh, this holiday season, NBC has the rights. They show it every single year. Uh, take the time when they show it and watch It's a Wonderful Life. It has a profound impact on American cinema history. In fact, one person said that it is the most inspiring film in America's cinema history. You should be familiar with the show. So, uh, but the show tells a story about a man named George Bailey, played by an actor named Jimmy Stewart. And George Bailey leads a, a savings and loans that just not doing well. He's losing money. He's afraid that they're going to close down on him. He's scared. And he begins to think that maybe life would have just been better if he had never been born. And he's sitting on the bridge contemplating that. And his guardian angel Clarence pops into the scene and, he's, and he takes George on a journey where he shows him the impact of his life. Actually, what happens is they, they grant the wish. They, they make it so that George Bailey never lived. And he gets to see what his community would have been like if he had never been there. And they go on this journey, and as he comes to the end, he gets to see the impact that he had on his community, on individual lives. And we get to see that one life, one person, can have a profound impact on others. Now, the story of Christmas is not that George Bailey's life changed our world. The story of Christmas is, is that with Jesus Christ's birth, with his death, with his resurrection, that everything changed. In the next three weeks, we're going to go on a series together where we're talking about how Jesus Christ changed everything. His life had significant impact. In fact, many of the great cultural works of art, from Shakespeare to Da Vinci, they were inspired by their faith in Jesus the greatest fantasy novels of the modern era, the Chronicles of Narnia and the Lord of the Rings, they come out of those authors' faith. Jesus' life was significant in ways that we don't recognize or that we just take for granted. The fact that we have hospitals and orphanages, the fact that many of our universities were founded as places of higher learning inspired by a belief in Jesus. In fact, many of our great scientists went on their journeys uh, and they found Christ in their science. The fact of the matter is is that Jesus' life changed everything. Well, how did he do that? This morning, I want to share with you one way in which Jesus' life changed everything. One way that he acted that completely revolutionized the world. And that, that basic thought is this, that Jesus broke down barriers by demonstrating God's love. Jesus broke down barriers to demonstrate God's love. I want to look at a story from Luke, and Luke is a gospel writer. He was also a historian and a doctor, and he researched the life of Christ, something he may have even been paid by a guy named Theophilus to do it. But he went in, and he dug, and he did eyewitness accounts, and he talked to people who were on the scene of the time, and they came up with a report, and he wrote it as the gospel. In Luke chapter 8, verse 40 is where we're going to begin today. Now, when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house, because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him, and she touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, no, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. And then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. And then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. 
Now, to maybe understand this passage a little bit better, you need to understand a little bit of the cultural context. The Jewish people would have preferred to worship in the temples, but they weren't able to because the travel distances often would keep them from going to the temple. And so anytime they had a village or community with at least 10 Jewish men, they would gather together in synagogues. And that's where they would read the scriptures and they would worship God and they would sing songs and they would learn more about what it meant to be one of God's chosen people. And in the synagogue, each synagogue was led by a synagogue ruler. This one was Jairus. And the synagogue ruler would be responsible for assigning who is going to read the scriptures that week, who is going to teach, who is going to lead the people in, in worship. They were a person of great influence. And because of that influence, they were also people of great wealth. Now, in stark contrast to Jairus and his life, we're also introduced to a woman. And we don't get the woman's name. The only thing we're told about her is that she's been subject to bleeding for 12 years. For 12 years, she's been battling a medical condition that's caused her to bleed without any help and without any remedies. In fact, the Gospel of Mark in this same story says that she spent all of her money going to doctors. And they, there was 11 different cures at the Talmud, an ancient Jewish text, that they would use, it says, to cure this. Three of them are this. Here's what the Talmud records for us. It says, take the gum of Alexandria, the weight of a small silver coin, of a woman the same and of crocus the same. Let them be bruised together and given in wine to the woman that has an issue of blood. Now, if this does not benefit her, take of Persian onions three pints. Boil them in wine and give her to drink and say, arise from thy flux. If this doesn't cure her, set her in a place where two ways meet and let her hold a cup of wine in her right hand and let someone come behind and frighten her, come up and scare her and say, arise from thy flux. They had all these different possible cures and she paid great money to have a doctor say, hey, let's go find this intersection. We'll sit you on the street here and we'll get somebody to come up behind you and scare you. And if that doesn't work, take a glass of wine. Uh, over and over again, she had been doing that. Over and over again, she had been trying and over and over again, she had failed. She's broken and alone and hurting and she reaches out to Jesus. In this woman's story, we see that Jesus broke down the barrier of class. You see, this bleeding issue was crippling her physically, financially, socially, spiritually. The loss of blood over an extended period of time would have made her feel weak and tired and worn out constantly. The doctors had taken all of her money and she had nowhere to go. She didn't have great insurance. There was no way to take care of it. She was broke. But there's a social thing happening as well because she had been labeled, according to Levitical law, she was labeled unclean. Which meant that not only was she unclean, but any place she laid, any person who laid in the same bed as her, anybody who sat in the same chair as her, anybody who touched her, they were ceremonially unclean as well and excluded from synagogue worship. They weren't allowed to go to the temple. They were excluded from the faith community. And so one commentator says that, that if she had been married or if she'd been promised in marriage, that, that she would have had to go through the ordeal of a divorce proceeding because her husband would not want to be unclean as well. So there she is, alone in this world. Excluded by her friends and family because she's been labeled unclean. And excluded from the synagogue as well. She wasn't allowed into the spiritual life, the spiritual life of their community. She wasn't allowed in the synagogue. She wasn't allowed to read the scriptures. She was kept at arm's length. And she was alone. You know, we have divisions in our culture as well today. We label people as upper class, part of the 1% or, or upper middle class or middle class or the working middle class or the working poor or, or those living below the poverty lines. But it's not even just an economic class thing. We put labels on all kinds of things. We classify all kinds of people. We see a lady going out to, to the bars on Franklin Street in the middle of the week and we think, oh, there goes a cougar. We see a creepy old guy doing that, and we go, yeah, that's a creepy old guy. Uh, we look at people and we see, oh, that's a soccer mom, or that's one of those parents. That's an addict. We place labels on all kinds of people. We look at them and we go, oh, they're single. They're divorced. They're unhappily married. They're maybe married. Oh, they're just living together. We place labels on all kinds of people. And in doing that, we continue to do the same things that were happening there. 
there's groups of people who feel like outcasts, unwanted, uncared for. And to those untouchables, the unlovely, the excluded, Jesus offers grace and healing. To the nobodies and the nameless, Jesus stops and spends time with them. He stops his world and talks with her. That's crazy on so many levels, not just because of this unclean issue that she had, but the fact that Jesus would even talk to a lady was, was groundbreaking. In fact, Jesus broke through the barrier of gender as well. You see, in the ancient Greco-Roman world, in the ancient Near Middle East, there was a huge shortage of women. In fact, there was 140 men for every 100 women. Today, those numbers are almost completely flip-flopped. Why was there this great disparity between men and women? It was because ladies, little baby girls, were often exposed. That meant that their parents would take them and they would place them out in the wilderness or out in the forest to be dealt with by nature rather than to be raised. In fact, one Greek philosopher and poet, he said this. He says, everyone raises a son, even if he's poor, but exposes a daughter, even if he's rich. So baby girls were dying left and right. But beyond that, if a woman was allowed to grow up into full womanhood, she still was not treated as, as a person. She didn't have some basic rights, basic dignity that we would bestow on our culture, on everybody. If a lady was raped, her husband or her father would be awarded damages just as if a a farm animal had been abused. If a woman were to testify in court about something, her testimony was not trustworthy. If a woman uh, in the Greek world, a woman wasn't allowed to walk by herself. She had to be escorted by a male because clearly she couldn't walk by herself. In the Jewish world, they weren't allowed to to even speak in the synagogue or read the scriptures. This wasn't just a Jewish thing. This wasn't, to be honest, this wasn't even just an ancient Near East thing. This was the ancient world at their time. And unless we get prideful, it still happens in our world today. In Yemen, A lady who goes to testify at court is counted as half a witness. In our world today, there is mutilation that happens. There are honor killings. There is trafficking. There are ladies who are denied basic human rights. There's forced marriage and there's abuse. That's our world today. Jesus stopped what he was doing. And he pursued this lady. Jesus was walking, and, and Jesus was sort of a rock star. And, and there was a crowd around him. And my little girls, they like uh, all those One Direction and Justin Bieber and all those Disney bands. And they get excited when they see him. And every time I see them on TV, there's always like this crowd of little girls like screaming, like, ah! And they're like reaching out and touching him. And Jesus had that experience going on. He's, he's walking with his disciples, and, and Jesus stops and he says, Somebody touch me. And Peter's like, Dude. Everybody's touching you. He's like, no, somebody touched me. And Peter's like, yeah, that dude, that dude, that dude. Everybody's touching you, Jesus. Literally, your inner crowd, everybody is touching you. No, Jesus said, no, somebody touched me and power left me. And it says that the woman realized that she couldn't hide. When I first read that, I was like, dude, Jesus, just leave her alone. Like, she's been through enough. Twelve years, she's been going through this, this junk. But then I realized that her shame was a public shame. Her hurt was a public hurt, and Jesus wanted to make her right publicly. In fact, the law required that if you've been healed from a disease that excluded you from the community, that to be reinstituted into the community, that you had to present yourself to a religious leader, and that religious leader would examine you and pronounce you clean, pronounce you okay to go back into the temple, pronounce you okay to go back into the synagogue, to be a part of the community again. So Jesus calls out this lady. She tells what happened, how she reached out, how she was instantly healed. And Jesus looks at her, and he uses a word that he only uses this one time in all of the New Testament. He calls her daughter. Daughter. To a girl who's probably been excluded from her family's holidays, from her family's meals, 
not welcome maybe in her father's home. Jesus looks at her and says, you're part of the family. You're part of who we are. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. And that word peace isn't just the absence of conflict, the absence of a disease, but he's saying you've been made whole. All that was wrong in your life is going to be restored. Jesus reaches beyond gender barriers to make this lady whole. And in doing so, he demonstrates the love of God that pursues us even in our brokenness. Now, while this is all playing out, there's another dude watching. A guy we were introduced to at the very beginning of the story, the synagogue ruler, Jairus. And imagine he's like sort of counting the time like, okay, like any moment, Jesus, we got to get going. We got to get going. And the whole time that that's playing out, he's waiting. And Luke continues the story in Luke 8, 49. He says, while Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. And hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. As I read this passage this week, I was able to empathize with Jairus. Jairus' daughter was about 12. My oldest daughter, Alyssa, is about 12. As I started placing myself in that story, I began to see how I would have reacted. Maybe you have children. Maybe there's someone that you deeply care about. Maybe it's a best friend. Uh, maybe it's the person, one of your teammates that you do everything with. This person that Jairus deeply loved he gets news that she's died. I don't know how Jairus reacted. The Bible doesn't say. I know how I would respond. I would have wanted to, to yell. Me? I'd probably have been, Jesus, what are you doing? My daughter! This is his only daughter. My only daughter is gone! What were you doing, Jesus? That lady, she's been sick for 12 years. One more day isn't going to make a difference. A day would have meant everything to my daughter. Where were you, Jesus? You were taking care of her? Jairus knew the lady's pain. He may have even been a source of it. As a synagogue ruler, he may have excluded her from worship. And he's watching her get healed while his heart breaks He walks back home, trying to trust Jesus, knowing that Jesus just healed this lady. Maybe he could do something. He walks home in a haze and a fog, not sure really what's going on, probably just step after step. He walks home and he, and he hears the group of people. They've gathered and they're crying and they're weeping. Friends and family have gathered and, and they're mourning over the loss of the little girl. Perhaps he walks in and he sees his wife huddled in, holding her little girl or, or maybe in a fetal position in a corner just rocking. It says when he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except for Peter, James, and John and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning and carrying on for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. You know, when we read this text, we often think like, maybe the ancients were like, just not so bright. Maybe they didn't really know what death looked like. Maybe she had just slipped into a coma. Maybe she was like, just, you know, maybe she was out of it. But death was a part of their world. They knew what death looked like. You don't have to have the periodic table to know what death looks like. You don't have to be able to look into a microscope. When you see those eyes go empty, it's clear. When you go from the labored breathing to not breathing at all, it's pretty clear. When the heart stops beating and life leads, it's clear. They weren't stupid. They knew what death looked like. 
And Jesus walks with Jairus into this little girl's room. And it says in verse 54 that he took her by the hand and he said, my child, get up. And her spirit returned and at once she stood up. And then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. And her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. The Gospel of Mark gives us one other clue about what happened. Jesus walks into the room and he utters a phrase in, in Aramaic. He says, Talithia kumai. Kumai means get up, arise, awaken. And the word Talithia, as I, as I studied it this week, one person uh, just gave me a whole new appreciation for who Jesus is and how he loves us. The word Talithia is a word that means little girl or little one. At our house, I call my littlest, my eight-year-old Morgan, I call her little one. I'm like, hey, little one, it's time for you to go take your shower. Hey, little one, it's time for bed. Hey, little one, it's time to get up. And Jesus walks into this room where this girl has been laid out. And he grabs her by the hand. And he gently says, little one, honey, time to get up. And air rushes into her lungs. She gasps. Her eyes flutter open. And she sees the face of Jesus. You see, Jesus broke through the barrier of death to demonstrate God's love. Jairus came to Jesus looking for a healing. And Jesus gave him a resurrection. You know, in middle school and high school, you're taught some literary terms, things that you can apply and help you understand literature. And one of those terms is foreshadowing. Foreshadowing is when you get a glimpse of something now that has implications for what's going to happen in greater detail later. This little girl's death foreshadows a greater resurrection. Her death was momentary. Jesus gets the report. He goes to the house that same day. He shows up and he raises the girl to life. Jesus hangs on a cross. He's taken down. Three days later, he rises from the tomb. Jesus conquered death. He broke through the barrier of death so that we could have life. The question becomes, how do we as a community, how do we as a community of believers take what Jesus has taught us and put it into practice in our own lives? As a, as a community of believers, how do, we take, and how do we take the gospel and the good news and the hope that Jesus Christ gives us, how do we take that to those who have been labeled unworthy? How do we take it to people who are, are hurting and in need? How do we demonstrate God's love to them? How do we break through the classes in our world? How do we go to people who've been left out of community or felt unwelcomed like this lady did for 12 years and take the gospel to them. This past week, we announced that my role has changed within the One Life Network. For the last four years, I've served as the campus pastor at One Life West. And over the course of that time, it's been an incredible journey. But one of the things we believe God is calling us to do more than ever is to plant churches and to take the good news, the hope of the resurrection to people where they are. As a strategy, our team has came down that we believe the best way to do that is through microsites. So we're going to be launching campuses, uh, sites around the community in, in places like Mount Vernon and maybe in Boonville or in western Kentucky or southern Illinois or around the region. At the same time, we're also going to be launching an online campus where we can meet people exactly where they are. They can be at home in their PJs, yet they can hear the good news of Jesus and they can experience extravagant worship. It's meeting people where they are. Even if they don't feel welcome inside the doors, even if they're scared to go into a church building, we take the church to them. There's others, maybe even within the scope of our geographic reach, maybe close to one of our campuses, who won't go in because they feel unwanted by society as a whole. Maybe they're living in a homeless shelter or incarcerated and in prison. The microsite strategy gives us a chance to take the gospel and take worship and take the good news to them where they are. It gives us a chance to break down barriers to help people demonstrate God's love to them, to help them experience Jesus. 
How do we as a community of believers take this good news about Jesus and how do we use it to break down the gender barrier? Did you know that a higher percentage of women hold university degrees than men, but they make more than 21% less than their male counterparts? We need to continue leading the way and and giving value to women. We need to place value on the contributions of women, not just in our homes, but what they offer at the church and what they offer in the marketplace. We need to allow them to use their gifts and abilities to their full capabilities. And we need to stand up against social injustices around the world where women are still dehumanized and treated as second-class citizens. We need to be the voice of Jesus to a broken world. Dorothy Sayers, author, teacher, wrote and she said, perhaps it is no wonder that women were the first at the cradle and the last at the cross. They had never known a man like this man, Jesus. There had never been such another, a prophet and a teacher who never nagged at them, who never flattered or coaxed or patronized, who never made arch jokes about them, never treated them as the woman, God help us, or ladies, God bless them, who rebuked without quarrelsomeness and praised without condescension, who took their questions and arguments seriously, who never mapped out their sphere for them, never urged them to be feminine or jeered at them for being female, who had no ax to grind and no uneasy male dignity to defend. Jesus treated women like nobody ever had. In fact, one scholar says that what's most amazing about the role of women in the Gospels is that they are even there. In a world that had put such a stark, low view of women, Jesus placed great value. And as a church and as followers of Jesus, we need to follow that example. Encouraging and loving others like Christ did. As husbands, that means that we need to love our wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. As fathers, that means that we need to teach our our girls that they have everything they need to do what God has created them to do. They aren't second-class citizens. They are full of potential and hope, and they could be difference makers. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to encourage ladies to use their God-given abilities, their spiritual gifts, to build up and to fan the flame of community. We need to be difference makers. We need to lead the way in this area. How can we help people realize the power of the gospel, the hope of the resurrection that Jesus Christ gives? When Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he put an end to the horror of death. Up to that moment, death was the scariest thing that could happen. It was ultimate. It was final. That was the end of the story. But with the resurrection of Jesus, with his Easter rising from the dead, he changed the scope of human history. Now we can look at death as, yes, it's sad, but it's momentary. Because because of Jesus, there is life eternal. Because Jesus Christ conquered death, we can face life with full of hope and joy now. We don't have to grieve as those who are without hope, Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica. Because Jesus Christ conquered death. Jesus broke through the barrier of death and gives us hope. He does this to bring hope to others. And it's a wonderful life. They say every man's life touches another. No person has had as great an impact or touched as many lives as Jesus Christ. The message of Christmas is that Jesus changed everything. He changed how we view others. He changed how we view death. He changed how we view God. God is not some distant creature, but he took on flesh and blood. And he moved into our neighborhoods. And he changed everything. For some of you, encountering Jesus like this is different than the Jesus that you've ever heard about. You never knew that Jesus cared about the fact of gender differences or or that Jesus cared about breaking down the divisions between people. You never knew the power of Jesus, that you thought that that resurrection thing was a one-time event, but that Jesus actually does it repeatedly throughout the Gospels. Jesus changed people's stories. 
And he can change your story too. Perhaps these barriers aren't the barriers that are keeping you from faith. Maybe there's something else. But could we trust that if Jesus was able to break through the barrier of class, if Jesus was able to break through the barrier of gender, if Jesus was able to break through the barrier of death, maybe he could break through your barrier as well. Maybe he could break through your barrier and prove himself real to you. You see, every story matters. Every life makes a difference and Jesus pursues each of us. I love it that Jesus stopped while walking with the high fluten, influential synagogue leader and loved on a nameless lady who was deemed unclean. There's nothing in your life that can keep you from experiencing God's love for you. He wants to know you and be known by you. He wants to pursue you. And he's willing to break down the barriers in your life to demonstrate God's love to you. Will you let him? You know, the Bible is pretty clear that it, it just says that we need to trust in Jesus. And it's not blind faith. We get to see real evidence. We can reason with it. But it says that if we believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that we are saved, that our lives are different. Because when Jesus comes in, everything changed. We want to give you an opportunity to respond today. In a moment, we're going to end this teaching time with prayer. And then we're going to go into an extended time of worship and prayer at our sites. I want to encourage you, lean into that. If you're on, on this side of the faith barrier, if you're asking and you're like, I don't know if God's real or not. I don't know if this whole Jesus thing can be bought and sold. I don't know. Like, I don't know if it's true. I want you to ask and say, God, Will you help break through these barriers in my life? And if you're on the other side, if you've believed, I want you to ask, how can we help others experience Jesus? How can we break through the barriers that are keeping them from experiencing all that God has for them? Let's pray. God, we thank you for the life of Jesus. I thank you that he broke through all the crud in our lives so that we could experience you. God, your love, your grace, your mercy are new every day. And so God, I pray that today that we would experience the fullness of your mercy and your grace in our lives. I pray that you would use us to help people far from God experience Jesus. And God, for those who maybe are on the fence, I pray that you would give them the boldness to confess their need for you their brokenness, and in faith to find healing and wholeness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.